for the past many months, all of us have been profoundly affected by this virus that has reached a worldwide pandemic. Probably never in any of our lifetimes have any of us ever witnessed a single calamity that has so touched just about every nation of the world all at one time. There's a real and credible threat of sickness and death. Yes, there is. But sadly, that fact has been and continues to be used and abused to further specific political and philosophical agendas. I think most people, most people in the season are simply looking for truth, looking for hope, looking for healing, looking for direction, looking for purpose. And I further believe that there are so many that, far more than we realize, so many more I think than we realize and imagine that are looking for real and authentic hope, truth, and life in the person of Jesus. With this in mind, with these thoughts in mind, my thoughts and my spirit is directed to share this word with you today. I will ask your indulgence because I'll probably stay quite close to my notes and not stray very far. Uh, I prayed and spent much time in writing these thoughts and I, I, I want to be able to share them as accurately as I can today. So stay with me if you will. Let's, let's begin by looking back. Let's go back to the days just before the birth of Jesus in Nazareth, Israel. For four centuries, Israel has not heard from nor seen a genuine prophet. There were prophets that came to Israel over the years of their history, and you knew they had a word from God. And the record of those prophetic words are recorded for us in so many of the books of the Old Testament. But now it's been 400 years, and no one has come in the tradition of Elijah or Elisha or Nathan or Zechariah or Hosea or Joel, no one. Oh, there had been priests whose words and actions were well-ordered and well within the structure of custom and within the confines of the boxes of proper procedure. And there had continued to be rabbis whose, whose teaching were focused on interpreting the pinhead details and the ancient laws and customs. But no one, no one had come or shown up with an authentic, clear, unfiltered, unbiased word from God. A word that may have been politically unacceptable, but certainly prophetically indisputable. And then, and then came John. The Bible just simply introduces him in the gospel of the disciple John. In the first chapter, the sixth verse, he had these words, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. What a way to be introduced. What a way to be introduced. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Well, where did John come from? Well, John was the child of a miraculous birth. His father, Zacharias, or Zachariah, was a Levitic priest. And Zachariah and his wife, Elizabeth, had wanted a child for many years, but it just didn't seem to happen. Zachariah is chosen by Lot to be the priest that would go into the temple on this one specific occasion. He goes into the temple in Jerusalem, and he has a moment that's, that's almost unimaginable. An angel, yeah, an angel appears to him and tells him, John, you and Elizabeth are going to have a child. And furthermore, it's not just going to be any child. This child is going to have a ministry where he will come in the, the likeness of or in the tradition of the ancient prophets. And this child will have a place in God's plan. This child will be a child that will help introduce and clear the way for the Messiah. The Bible says that 
Zechariah even sang this song over the little boy. Can you imagine a child in his little manger and, and, and her little crib and dad singing over the child? It's quite lengthy, but just this even one part of his song, he says, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 76, records, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. I want to believe that child was raised in a unique home. The Bible even tells us that about his upbringing a little bit. It was very strict. His parents knew there was something special about this little one. And as years went by, they would teach him and speak to him of the prophecies that they felt understood or declared who their son would be. One of those prophecies was a, a prophecy of Isaiah. And I, I think that this little guy had become very familiar with all of the teaching. But as he becomes a young adult, we find him out in what the Bible calls a wilderness. Uh, it really was more of a desert. It's uh, uh, the geography. It's the land that is between the mountains that surround Jerusalem and the Jordan Valley down to the east. It's that area where Jesus went and spent time just before he began his ministry. It's an area where the Samaritan was robbed by robbers. It, 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 it's an area that you wouldn't really want to live in. And even today, there's very little there except deep gorges and, and steep climbs and scrub brushes and bushes and dust and sand and rocks. A lot of rocks. That's this desert area that John goes to. And I sort of see him going there because something is in him now. He's at a point in his life where he, he really needs to know for himself, who am I? What's my identity? And what's my purpose in life? I've heard my dad. I've heard my mom. I know the stories of how, how I was born. And I know what was spoken over me in that, that, that event that happened in the temple. But I need to know for myself. So he goes into sort of a self-exile out into this barren land and he begins to search, he begins to pray, he begins to trust and believe that God was going to speak to him. And then John has a discovery. It's recorded in Luke's Gospel again, chapter 3, verse 2. Just these simple words, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zechariah in the desert. Whoa. Think about that. The word of the Lord came to him in the desert. Now, John would have been very familiar with the prophecies about himself. And he certainly would have been familiar, as I said earlier, with the prophecy of Isaiah. For in the book of Isaiah, in the 40th chapter, there is a prophetic word about what was coming. Listen to this very carefully. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, a voice of one calling. There would come a voice who would be calling, and this is what that voice would be speaking. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I think something absolutely intriguing, inspiring, exciting happened in the desert. As John is sitting down perhaps to read from the parchment of the prophet that he perhaps brought with him into the desert, and as he begins to read these words, a voice of one calling, and something begins to happen to him. Am I that voice? Is this prophecy about me? A voice calling in, 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 in the wilderness, this voice is to declare a way to the Lord. And, and, and not only just to speak it, but to be involved in, in helping to bring up the down places and bring down the up places and straighten out the crooked places and make smooth where it's difficult and make the way to the to Messiah. Or we would just simply this way, say it this way, make the way to Jesus straight, easy, simple. And in that moment, 
those words literally leap out of the text, off of the parchment and into his heart. And what was logos, the written word of God, now becomes rhema, the breathing of God. The actual Greek word that's translated in the text, the word of God came to John, is the breath or the, the heart, the voice, the living word comes into John's spirit and what he had held in his hand, now he holds in his heart. And he realizes, I have a word of the Lord and that the mouth of the Lord has spoken this to me. John has discovered his identity. He's discovered his purpose for life. Now, the whole change of attitude. He returns, but now first he goes to the Jordan River, which would become the center of his area of ministry. People come to him and they look at him and they haven't seen anybody quite like him before. And they say to him, who are you? And very quickly the word gets out and, and priests come all the way down from Jerusalem through the desert. They come to ask him, who are you? John answers with these words. It's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 23. He says in response to their question, I am the voice. I am the voice. I know my identity. The voice of one calling in the wilderness to make straight the way of the Lord. John is basically saying, I know who I am and I know why I'm here. I sought for a word, just one word that could describe what John is trying to tell us, what he is, what he's saying. And I thought of the word, well, he, he's talking about his purpose, but it's more than purpose. And I thought about the, the French words, raison d'être, which means reason to be. That's, that's what he had discovered in the desert. But I just wanted just one simple word and I came to this word and it found its way into the title of this message and some of you have been wondering and maybe others of you have already looked it up. The word is tell us. John had found his tell us. The word tell us is defined, you could probably find a definition very similar to this one. It refers to one's inherent purpose or one's raison d'etre or the supreme end of one's endeavors. It was first coined and used by the Greek philosopher Aristotle, and it is still used today by scholars. And so now all of us are scholars. We know the word tell us. John found his tell us. So that's the introduction to my message. In case you're worried that that's all there is to it. No, it's just the introduction. I want to help us understand what the Holy Spirit wants us to see about John's tell us and realize that there's some things we need to learn and know here right and now. So, I guess my question is, what about you? Have you found your tell us? Have you found your reason to be, your highest purpose of your life's endeavors, your truest purpose for living? Have you found that? Do you, do you know who you are? Have you found your identity? Those are difficult questions and were questions that nevertheless demand an answer. The simplest answer for all of us, if we're seeking for our, our identity, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ and you've been born again as Jesus talked about, then your identity is very plain. The Bible says you are a child of God. You and I are not just the name that appears on our driver's license or when you sign, sign, it, sign a check. It's been a long time since I signed a check. This environment has changed so many things. But you are more than your signature. You are a child of God. Let that just sink into your spirit for a moment. That's your identity. You are a child of God. 
But the Bible also helps us to understand, and we see that John not only found out who he was, but he found out his truest and highest purpose. And I ask you today, have you, have you discovered why you're here? Have you discovered the, the purpose for your life? Not just who you are, but why you're here. Do you know? Let me tell you, every person who's listening to this message and everyone who will never hear this message, the truth, same is true of all of us. We were all born for a reason. I shared some of these thoughts, at least at this moment part, uh, a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday encouragement. None of us are here by chance. None of us are an accident. Regardless of the story of your conception or your birth, it is not an accident. And you came into this world, and God brought you into this world for a purpose and a reason. May I say it this way? You are a gift from God to a place and space. You're a gift from God to a place in this world and to a space of time in the continuum of history. You are a gift of God here and now in this place and in this space of time. That includes this season in which we all live. Jesus declared the true purpose of every follower of him. Why are we here? We're not here by accident. Why are we here? Jesus declared, your tell us in mind that we are children of God and that we are called to be true and faithful witnesses of the message of his love, his grace, his power, of Jesus himself. We are called to be living witnesses in our place and during the time of our space in life. That's what we are called to do. That's our telus. And I love what we learn from the story of John, and this is why I appeal to this story to begin this message, that we are called to point people to Jesus. John said, my calling, my place, is to make it plain, make it clear how to get to Jesus how to find Jesus in the desert of your life, how to find Jesus in the most difficult places of your life. I'm here to help uh, rearrange the geography around us so that you can find Jesus. In this season, in this season, I believe that the message of the gospel of Jesus. Jesus is being preached and taught and spoken of and released more in the public arena today than I believe he has ever been in all of time or in all of history. We are living in an amazing moment. I know it's a difficult moment, but I believe with all of my heart, please hear me, I believe this is an amazing moment for every one of us today. This is a time when there are people all around us, believe it or not, you don't know it, you don't see it, you don't hear it enough, it's not reported in very many places, but I believe there's a lot of people that are seeking for Jesus today. I believe that people are tired, they're, they feel hopeless, they're weary, and and they're depressed, they're discouraged, they're anxious, and they say, where do they turn? And in those moments, there are so many people, I believe, that are turning to Jesus. What an amazing moment we live in. I'm preaching in an empty room, and that's not easy, and I'm sure it's by no means ideal. But do you know what? That the doors of this church are open today who, to anybody, just even if they're holding a cell phone, holding a tablet, listening through another device of some sort electronically. Do you know the doors of this house are open literally around the world today and that never happened before? And not only this house, but do you realize that the gospel is being declared today in more places by more people and is being viewed by more people, I believe, than ever in history? Don't tell me that's an accident. Don't tell me that's a bad thing. God can use anything for his glory. And I know that there's some of us are saying, oh, I wish this thing would end. I've said it too, and perhaps you're saying it, but can you hear me for a moment? If God's doing something, say, God, you do what you want to do as long as it takes. 
If there are people that are reaching out to Jesus, and I believe with all of my heart that there are those that are trying to get to Jesus right now. They've tried everything else, and now they're saying, Jesus, I want to give an opportunity for you to come into my life. I want to get to know you. I believe this season can produce the greatest harvest that souls of souls that's ever been. But here's the conjunctive word here, the conjunction. But the alternative to that or the other side of that is just as it is an amazing opportunity for people to find Jesus, it is also an opportunity when the enemy the devourer, the destroyer of souls wants to come and destroy the word that's being given, wants to destroy the opportunity, wants to somehow warp the appearance of Jesus so that people can't see him clearly, they can't get to him. They get like that desert where there's gorges so deep they can't get out or there's mountains so high they can't get over them or it's so crooked they lose their way or there's so many obstructions they just can't get over them and they give up. My challenge, oh, hear me today. This is my challenge to everybody who's listening. And I realize that so many, that probably the majority for sure, are Christians that would listen to a preacher preach on a Sunday morning or whenever you're listening. My challenge is to the church today. I, I wish I could just comfort you. But I'm going to cause a little bit of challenge and a little bit of affliction here in the next few minutes. I was thinking there's not many people in the room, so I'm not worried about set stepping on toes. But I might be stepping on some toes for a few minutes before I finish this message. Hear me, there are people that are trying to get to Jesus and the enemy is determined to stop them from getting there. And I'm not going to talk about all of the methods and uh, things that he uses, the weapons he used. But I'm going to talk about this for a moment. I believe it is a, just an absolute tragedy when the enemy is able to employ careless words and careless actions of Christians to become deterrents and obstructions for people that are trying to get to Jesus. Hmm. I know that Jesus said that the path to eternal life would be narrow. Yes, he did say that, but he never said it would be blocked. He never said you'd have to climb over boulders to get to him. He never said you'd have to go down into deep valleys or up over mountains. The way is simple. It should be clear, and it's for everybody. It's there. John says, my talus in life is to be the one who would speak and do everything possible to make it easy for people to get to Jesus. My challenge to the church today is let's make it easy for people to get to Jesus. Let's make the record clear. It doesn't mean changing the, the gospel. The gospel is perfect on its own. It just, let's, it just means make sure that we're not allowing the enemy to use our words or our actions to stop people from getting to Jesus let me give you some examples. Hold on to your seats. The Holy Spirit is appealing through me to you today, to all of us as Christians, to not allow our words or our actions to be obstructions to those who are looking for Jesus. And so number one, I am appealing. I am appealing to all of us Christians who don't realize at times that we misrepresent the heart of Jesus. And we do, we, when we do, we make it difficult for people to come to Jesus. God gave Jesus and Jesus came that the whole world might be saved. I'm appealing to any Christian who misrepresents the heart of Jesus by apply, implying that the world means only one country or one culture or one class or one color. We block the path to Jesus when we imply that the whole world doesn't mean whosoever will come. No one has the right, no one has the right to filter the gospel through their own personal screen of acceptability. Goodness and righteousness are not requirements to come to Jesus, they're results of having come to Jesus. Let's clear the way. Let's clear the way. I'm appealing to Christians who 
knowingly or unknowingly mis misrepresent the hands of Jesus. His hands, certainly they are welcoming, as I just said, like his heart is, it's welcoming, but his hands are also giving. Jesus talked about the importance of, of caring for the little ones and the least and the lost of our culture and of our society. James records these words, chapter 1, verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts is pure, as pure and faultless as this. Here it is. Look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep yourself from being, from being polluted by the world. Look after the little ones. Look after the hurting ones. Look at those who are in desperate need. The hands of Jesus not only receive those who come to him, but his hands reach out to the hurting and the helpless. I hear this song on my radio quite often. If we're the body of Jesus, then why aren't his hands reaching? Oh, but pastor, don't forget that verse talks about not being polluted by the world. Oh, yes, it does. But let's make sure we understand that the pollution of the world is a heart issue. It's not a hand issue. Hands that are made dirty because they stop to help a stranded motorist change a flat tire is not the pollution of the world. In fact, I think Christians with dirty hands is a good idea. That means you're getting out there and helping somebody. Your heart can be clean. That's the important issue. I'm appealing to Christians. Let's clear the way for Jesus to be seen and heard. I'm appealing to Christians that mistreat one another. Oh, some of you might want to just get rid of this feed right about now because you're saying he's going too far. I've got to find somebody who's going to encourage me. I'm not done yet. Hold on. But I am appealing to Christians. Let's clear the way to Jesus, especially Christians who knowingly or unknowingly mistreat one another, Christians who criticize, Christians who slander, Christians who gossip. Oh, we don't talk about those things, but they're real. And they stop people from getting to Jesus. Once again, James writes, it's recorded in the scriptures, chapter 1, verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious, yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue, deceive themselves. And their religion is worthless. That's tough stuff. I had this picture in my mind. People trying to get to Jesus. And there's some Christians right in front of them. And they need to get around these Christians to get to Jesus. But they just keep stumbling over their tongues. They stumble over the tongues of Christians. I would get to Jesus, but I just can't get past your tongue. Sounds silly, but it's sad. I heard a story I've got to bring something lighter into this message. I heard a story one time about a pastor who, who he, he became aware that people were very frustrated with the tie that he was wearing. He'd gotten this tie, and it was flashy. It was a little bright. All right, it was a lot bright. And it wasn't me. This isn't for a friend. I heard this story. And uh, back in the days when all the pastors were wearing ties. And this pastor had a tie on. And... He got word that somebody in his church was very offended by that tie. It was garish. It was too flashy. It didn't belong. And the word was going around from this individual. So the pastor had an idea, and he said, I'm going to make this right. He went to the individual, stood in the home, and he said, it's come to my attention that uh, my tie has called you, caused you offense. Oh, and of course the individual, oh, no, no, it's pastor, it's all right. No, I've, I've heard from several people that you're talking about my tie. Well, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, I, I've done something. As you can see, I'm wearing the tie you're talking about today, he said. I'm wearing the tie, and he was wearing it. And he said, and, and furthermore, I, I, I brought these scissors. And, and, if, and if, you want, if you want to just go ahead and clip my tie off because it offends you, you go ahead and do that. No, pastor, I wouldn't do that. No, seriously, just go ahead and just take it right there. And, and so the, the individual said, fine, I'll take a chance. And went to, held the tie and zip, zip, zip right across and cut the tie. And the pastor said, I hope you feel better. Yeah. Yes, I do. And he said, thank you. And the pastor was about to leave and he said, wait, wait just, just a minute. Since I have these scissors here, uh, 
would you mind just sticking your tongue out because it offends me? This is what I needed a lot of people in the room. Hope, you've, hope you got that. I'm appealing to Christians. Let us be careful not to stop or hinder the way for people coming to Jesus. And I'm appealing to Christians. Hear me carefully here. Christians who dress themselves in their own handmade costumes of righteousness and think they fooled everybody else. Hmm. The Bible talks about righteousness that's our own. The Bible says they're like filthy rags. Jesus says these words recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, verse 23, or tra- chapter 23, verse 25. And in that chapter, he says, Woe to you, hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside the cup and the dish are full of greed and self indulgence. These are people who act apart, even though they have no part in the presentation of Christ. These are those who are hoping for a generous goodie bag to accompany their Oscar-worthy performance in the role of being a Christian. But the Bible tells me that there will come a day when some will stand before Jesus and will say, you looked the part, you played the part, but you're never really part of the play at all. I don't know you. I'm glad this isn't quite the end of the message because it's a tough place to end. But the Holy Spirit is calling us church. I believe this is a day, a season that God can use for tremendous things. Let's not stop people from finding Jesus. They're looking for him. Let's clear the way. Let's open the path. God is calling the church right now, right here. He's calling the church where you are. And he's calling all of us. Make the way clear. I'm asking, are you, are we providing a clear and unobstructed path to Jesus? When people are trying to find Jesus, are we encouraging them? Are we pointing the right direction? Are we an obstruction? Are we in hindrance? When seekers encounter Jesus, when people have come to Jesus and they're already on the path and others are coming up behind them, do they see Jesus in them? Do they see Jesus in us? The Apostle Paul wrote these words to the church in Galatia. Simple little word, but a marvelous word. Paul says, God who called me by his grace, grace, Paul knew his telus. Paul who says, God who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son, and the next word is so important, in me. Paul knew what it was to have Jesus revealed to him. But he says, God was also pleased to reveal Jesus in me. When people are looking for Jesus, they're seeking a way to find him. Is there something in you that makes it clear what Jesus looks like and where he can be found? And I have this picture in my mind of a believer on a path to try and find Jesus and in front of them is another believer and the one who's behind is trying to see Jesus and in that moment the one in the front so displays the Jesus that's in them that the one behind can look right through the heart of the believer and see Jesus there That's what Jesus wants to do in us today. We sing a song around here. Christ be magnified in me. I've asked Pastor Ty and the team if they would sing it this morning. 
What a wonderful, wonderful aspiration. Christ, be lifted up, be magnified in me. I want the way to Jesus to be clear right through my life. Sing it, guys. Sing it all. Cunningham has been a hero to a lot of people for a lot of years. It's quite a few years ago now that Lauren began a ministry called YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Lauren is known for having maybe coined this phrase, to know Christ and to make Christ known. That was Lauren's tell us. It's a wonderful way of declaring what ours should be as well. To know Christ. To make Christ known. For John, it was to be a voice and to clear the way to Jesus. Find your tell us. Own your tell us. Let Christ use you to be a part of changing the world for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word spoken to us today. Lord, I pray that you would take the words that we've heard in this place and at this time and use them for your glory. And I pray that our eyes would be open to see that an event that has shaken a whole world is the very kind of event that Jesus can use to make himself known. And Lord, we want to be among those who will point the direction and clear the way so that anybody and everybody can find hope and forgiveness, cleansing, healing, truth, and life in Jesus Christ. If you need to pray that prayer today, I pray with you right now. 
Jesus, I welcome you into my life. Thank you for loving me, for dying for me. And in this moment, I welcome you right now to come inside of me, to become alive in me and make me truly alive so that I can be born again, a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. You prayed that, you mean it, you believe it. Something has happened now that has changed your life for the rest of time and for eternity. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. We'll see you next week.